Hey, it's Greg Getter, and I'm back with another travel-related video. I just got back from a trip to Asia, which had me in five different cities, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka. I've been a user of Project Fi, Google's wireless service, for a couple years now, and I wanted to give an impression of how it works overseas. Now, this is not the first time I've been to Hong Kong and China with Project Fi. I actually took my Nexus 5X to Hong Kong and two cities in China in 2016. So I want to contrast the experience in late 2016 with my experience just recently in spring 2018. So first let's talk about what happened in 2016. Hong Kong in 2016 was not a problem. I was able to get LTE everywhere, even on the subways in the city. I was able to data roam and I was charged the same rate that I was at home. And also I was able to make text messages with no problem. Now China was a bit of a different story. In Chengdu, everything worked pretty well. I usually got HSPA Plus and sometimes LTE service there. But when I was on the subways there, I often got edge service and sometimes no service in the subways. Now when I went to Shenzhen in 2016, I had absolutely no service. Apparently this was due to an agreement that T-Mobile, the actual carrier that carries Project Fi, had with one of the local carriers that they were trying to work out. Now contrast that to my trip this year, things were a little bit different. Now Hong Kong was exactly the same this year. There was LTE all the time. There were a few instances where there was HSPA plus in tall buildings, but everywhere else there was LTE. I was even able to make some phone calls these were made over the cellular connection and not over Wi-Fi, so I was charged for these calls, and we'll review the costs later. So the second leg of this year's trip was to Japan, and things worked pretty well in Japan. The only issue I had was when I landed at Narita, the airport that's near Tokyo. It seemed like it was taking my phone a really long time to connect, so I ended up rebooting the phone, and as soon as I rebooted, it hopped right on the network. So just keep that in mind. If your phone is not finding the signal, you might just have to reboot the phone for whatever reason. In Japan, the phone worked really well. Otherwise, even in the subways, I was usually able to get LTE. Sometimes it was HSPA+, plus, but the speeds were certainly acceptable and I had really no problems at all. I even made a call or two in Japan and the same thing happened where I wasn't on Wi-Fi, so I couldn't get the free call but it worked nevertheless. Texting was just fine. Now I did spend two days in Shenzhen on this trip and things were a lot better this time around than they were in 2016. Most of the time, my speeds were either LTE or HSPA+. However, in the subways, it was usually only edge service that I was getting. Now I've heard that this is because Google's preferred network is not the one that provides HSPA or LTE in the subways. But I've also heard that there's an app called Signal Spy that will allow you to manually connect to different networks. I wasn't able to try this. I didn't spend that much time on the subways in Shenzhen. But if you go to China, you should probably download this app because it might help you connect to a faster network manually, forcing your phone to get to get the right connection. Now what was really fascinating this time around was that I was able to access Google services and other American sites that are sometimes blocked in China. For example, Gmail, YouTube, Facebook, and Medium. These are all sites that you normally can't get on in China without a VPN, but they worked without a hitch on Project Fi on the main phone. Now I did bring a second iPhone with me that had a Project Fi data only SIM and this device did not allow connection to the American sites. Those sites were blocked. So access to these normally blocked sites really only seems to work on the main Android phone that has the calling and data service. Now when I connected my phone to Wi-Fi, such as at the hotel I was staying at, I was no longer able to access these sites. So YouTube, Facebook, Gmail were only accessible when I was only connected to the data network on the phone. Who knows if this is going to last? It seems that Google either has an agreement or because such a small number of people are using this service that it's kind of flying under the radar right now. But it is a huge leg up right now. The only consideration is looking at sites like YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram can easily start adding up the cost of data. So you probably want to weigh whether you're going to go unlimited that month or you want to save some money by not roaming on these sites. So let's take a look at my account for the month. I'm going to go to my statement. 
Now you can see here that they're actually credits from the last few months, and that was because I had a defective Nexus 5X where Project Fi actually credited me back 200, around $200, which was what I paid for the device. Let's take a look at April, which was the month that I traveled for the most part. The trip was actually April 1st to April 27th, but this was the majority of the trip, so you'll get a very good idea of how much data I used on the trip and how costs worked out. So you can see my cost for the month was $125, and before you freak out, Keep in mind that I'm also paying for a phone on this plan, which is about $35 a month, I believe. Yes, it's $35.38 for the device. So this device is actually financed, and there's no additional fee for financing the device, so it's definitely a way to go. Now, I also got a $1.37 send credit from the previous month, but it's such a small number that the actual costs are very close. So you can see that I used a pretty good amount of data. I used about five gigabytes of data, which is more than the one to two gigabytes I normally use in a month. However, Project Fi is only charging me the same data rate that I would pay at home. So it's quite a good deal to pay $50 for just five gigabytes of data when I normally don't have to pay that much because I normally don't use that much. Now, I didn't do a lot of YouTube or these types of things while roaming because that would quickly make my data more expensive. But if I wanted to, if I had used six gigabytes of data or more, it wouldn't have charged me any more per month. So I was actually pretty close to that threshold. So keep it in mind that you can spend just a little bit more money and have basically unlimited data overseas. Now, I made some international calls. Uh, one was in Hong Kong and two were made from Japan. The first one was quite a long call. You can see it was 47 minutes long and Project Fi charges you 20 cents a minute, which is not the cheapest, but it's certainly not the most expensive data rate either. So that one call cost me $9.40. But considering that I would normally have to travel to meet this person even at home, it's really not a bad deal to charge $9.40 for a call when I'm halfway around the world. Now, the other calls were shorter, 10 minutes and 13 minutes long, um, and these were only $2 and $2.60 respectively. So, again, you know, you're paying for the calls, but it's okay. Sometimes you are able to make phone calls over Wi-Fi, but even when you are connected to a Wi-Fi network, sometimes the phone doesn't think that the quality of service is good enough to make calls over Wi-Fi. And it also depends on what country you're in to determine whether the phone will actually decide to make the free Wi-Fi call or try to connect over the cell phone network. Of course, there is a $20 base fee for the service uh, per month, which gives you unlimited calls and texts for $20. So that $20 payment is included in the service. And then you have some taxes, all the fun stuff. So at the end of the day, $125, including the $35 device payment and including roaming calls, you know, really makes this quite a good deal. To spend $50 on international data that's normally the same speed as what I would get at home, LTE or HSPA Plus in general, uh, sometimes Edge, was quite a good deal. So that's my impression of Project Fi in 2018. While it's not perfect, it's far better than almost any other alternative, and it really ends up being a lot cheaper than most other plans if you are an American and are able to get a plus one number. For people who are able to sign up for this service in the US, it's far superior to any of the other carriers who tend to really gouge you when you roam, and a lot of times the service is not even going to work, depending on the plan that you're subscribed to. While you are limited to just a few devices on Project Fi, I have to say that if you're comfortable spending the money, the Pixel 2 XL has been a really great phone. So this is a really great option as long as you're comfortable using one of the quite good phones that Google provides on this service. Project Fi has a lot of advantages over other carriers, such as allowing you to only pay for the amount of data you use, but having a cap on that so if you use a lot of data in one month, it won't charge you hundreds of dollars. So I highly recommend that you check it out. I have a link in the description that will get you $20 off Project Fi service, which is basically the base rate for the first month. Thanks for watching and be sure to hit like and subscribe so you'll be the first to know when I come out with a new video.